Good evening, everyone. Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for our Observing Bird Movements webinar. My name is Lindsay Glasner. I am the first in K through 12 Outreach Coordinator. I'm joined tonight with my partner in crime, Kelly Schaefer. She's the Birds with Education Specialist. And between the two of us, we're gonna help you guys navigate observing bird movements using citizen science data. So this webinar is inspired by this Saturday's big lab event, Global Big Day. It's also International Migratory Bird Day. So we're getting very excited. Kelly and myself are preparing anxiously uh, where we're gonna go birding and how many birds we can see. If you happen to be birding on Global Big Day or are active on Twitter, feel free to follow us uh, via Twitter at BirdSloop and see what birds we're finding, but also share with us what birds you're finding. For those of you who may be new to our webinar series, we are using the Zoom platform. Um, Fairly simple and easy to work with. When I share my screen, you likely went into full screen. We'll be trying to have this as interactive as possible. So using, click on the chat window, I, button, I recommend exiting full screen. And when you have your chat window open, it will just show up on the side there. What's really uh, helpful for us, because we want this to be an interactive webinar, the information you share with Kelly and I would also be beneficial for the other participants. So when you type in the chat window, please click everyone we would like your messages to go to everyone if you do have any privacy or personal concerns you can always hit just to the panelists um, but any general comments we'd love for everybody to see those so let's test out this chat window and please let us know in the chat window what type of educator you are and then where in the world you're joining us from So I'm seeing some Ecuador, Honduras, Texas, uh, New York. Yeah, we have a New York here. Um, St. Martin, North Carolina, Massachusetts, Florida, Virginia, Washington, Massachusetts. Wow, we have people from all over the world, as well as all over the United States. And it looks like we do have a great diversity of both informal educators, naturalists, as well as classroom teachers. Um, Portugal, wonderful, being bird guides. So this is really exciting to have you guys join us from all over the world. So I am currently presenting this webinar at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology with Kelly sitting next to me. We're somewhere hidden in the middle of that building there. But the lab is a nonprofit membership institution dedicated to interpreting and conserving the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. Now, specifically, Kelly and myself are with the Birds of K-12 education team. So we create innovative resources that are building science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity, and engage in citizen science projects. Now, before we begin, I want us to just quickly review this image. In the chat window, can you share with us what you think we're looking at? Night illumination, night pollution, migration radar, lights. The first thought, yeah, Lauren, most of the time when people first see this, the first thought could be light pollution. But I mean, we're, we're in a birding webinar, so of course it has something to do with birds. And this image is actually representative of citizen science. Every single dot on this map is a checklist that's been submitted to eBird. eBird is the largest citizen science project here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and that's who will be gathering the data for Global Big Day. So in this webinar, we're gonna be focusing on today's presentation. We'll discuss what citizen science is and specifically focusing on eBird, again, our largest citizen science project. We'll break into discussion around migration and why birds migrate, 
our next goal for the day will be focusing on how we as educators can use citizen science data with students to help them understand the concept of migration. And then we'll finish off the webinar with a discussion around how you and the youth that you work with can then contribute to eBird and the eBird database by participating in Global Big Day. So we talked about citizen science, this is the main focus of today. I just wanna know the background of everybody. So in the chat window, could you share with us if you participated in any citizen science and if so, which projects? Merlin, Eber, Feeder Watch, Nest Watch, iNaturalist, Christmas Bird Count. Awesome. So we definitely have some people here who are familiar with eBird and with Citizen Science. Monarch Watch. Awesome. Well, when we think of Citizen Science here at the Lab of Ornithology, we really focus on this idea that people everywhere are using basic scientific protocols to report observations of natural events. And we look at this image again, this is our first image that looks like light pollution, but it's hundreds of thousands of participants all across the world who are contributing millions of observations every year, every day, allowing scientists to ask questions that we've never before been able to answer. And so when we think of citizen science at the lab, we think of it as a way for you and the youth you work with to learn about birds, science, and conservation by participating in this real scientific study. And really, we're forming a partnership between the public and professional scientists, and that makes up one of the world's largest research teams. Now, our focus today is going to be around eBird. And that's a wonderful model of citizen science. And it's a project follows these four simple steps. First, identifying and observing the birds, collecting that data, entering that data online, and then retrieving and viewing that online data. I really appreciate eBird's data transparency. Um, this process of accessing the data online is what will really help beginner birders understand what birds might be found near you, but it also helps educators teach data exploration and scientific inquiry. Now, this transparent database is quite important. Currently, eBird has collected more than 400 million observations. That's in 25 million checklists, and there are over 28 million hours of birding that have been recorded in eBird. So again, when I talk about we, through citizen science, create the world's largest research team, uh, a simple group of researchers can't go out and collect 28 million hours of data. That truly is a global partnership, a true effort. And we've had over 360,000 participants uh, through every single country of the world. Now, what I really appreciate is we've had over 10,000 species of uh, birds. And that's over 98% of the world's bird populations that we know of. So it's quite exciting uh, how rich this database is. Now, as educators, uh, we want to focus on how we can use such a database as an educational tool. eBird uh, has helped us with the data be able to create um, such products like the one here on your screen. Now take a moment and just look at what we need, uh, interpret what we're looking at. And when you're ready, in the chat window, can you just uh, put out one or two words of what you think we are looking at here? Absolutely. I haven't pitched it this way before, and I was telling Kelly, you know, 
my first hope is that people will say migration right away. And that's what you guys did. Um, you're right on my track here. It's absolutely what we are looking at at first, just the basic concept is migration. We are seeing bird movement over a period of time. And so let's just break down the basic definition of migration. Usually when science talk, scientists talk about migration, they're referring to a seasonal migration. And this is a large scale annual movement of some or all of a population. And it's between their summer breeding grounds and their non-breeding wintering grounds. For those of us in North America, we may think of North American birds that are usually neotropical migrants who fly between Canada or Northern United States to Central or South America. But not all migratory birds are neotropical migrants. For example, Canada geese, they are North American birds, but they don't migrate to Central or South America. Some migratory populations of Canada geese are actually not going as far south in the winter as they used to. And this is where uh, we can start looking at the eBird database and start seeing these trends that migration isn't going as far south for this population. Um, this northward range shift has been attributed to changes in farming practices as well as um, hunting pressures and even changes in weather and climate. So we look at migration and we understand, okay, it's a seasonal movement. It's that visualization that we just saw in the previous model. But a common question that we need to bring up as educators is why do birds migrate? So let's go in the chat window again. Why do birds migrate? And I'm gonna challenge you to think like the youth you work with. What answers might they come up with of why birds migrate? <laughs> Paige, that made me laugh. They get bored. Vacation, sunlight, lots of food, leading the snow, lots of reproduction. That's great. Um, for me, when I've done this with little kids, uh, they give me answers like you, Paige, of they get bored. Um, they're trying to get out of the snow. Uh, they to get away from predators to go on a vacation i love those but as we start to get in the older groups we want to make sure that yes finding food um different climates reproduction is also being thrown into the mix there so as a clarification so we're all on the same page it is a common misconception especially with kids that birds do not migrate because of the cold in fact, these birds may look grumpy, but being out in the cold and snow, it's not actually the main reason for birds to migrate. The cold can be a factor involved in why birds migrate, uh, but it's not the fact that they are actually cold. So if it's not cold, what is it? Uh, many of you people addressed the answer, and that's food. Food is the biggest motivating factor when it comes to migration. Some food sources like insects, they're scarce in the winter because of the cold, because of the snow. And that's why winter actually is one of the most important bird feeding seasons for the resident birds to help ensure that the resident birds are getting enough food. For those of us up in the north, I'm sure Ecuador, you don't quite have that problem. I hope you don't have that problem. <laughs> but food sources are steadily available in the tropics year round. Um, that's why many birds will migrate there in the winter time. They're following their food source. Now, why are birds migrating up north? It's also food driven. There's a plentiful uh, food source up north during that spring summer time period, but it's also helping um, looking at uh, breeding opportunities and breeding seasons. So many of you mentioned reproduction. Um, and there were many uh, topics about predation. So food though, as a main driver, is a big driver. 
Uh, but it's not the only factor. Thinking about reproduction, thinking about predation, et cetera, those are all very important. Now, I want us to look at this model again. We were all able to observe it and come away with the key pattern that migration is clearly happening here. On our x-axis, we have time. However, y-axis, we haven't labeled for you. That's part of a intentional. I want you guys to take a moment to look at this model. And then in the chat window, let me know some observations you're making. Okay, so we're not seeing much red in Florida. Density. A circular movement. Interesting, Michelle. We have a large uh, density, I guess we can call it, based off Tom's description, in June in the middle of the United States. So one question I can ask you is, what do we think that y-axis represents? Abundance. Grams of insects, bird populations, abundance. OK. So let me ask you this question then. Do you think this map represents a several a group of birds, multiple species, or a single species? Okay, there seems to be a general consensus. This is a single species. Absolutely. So you are correct. This is one single bird species. And our y-axis is similar to abundance. This is occurrence, likelihood occurrence. You'll see that our scale is from zero to one. So this is the percentage uh, you will likely see a bird occurring. Now, this is a model generated by the eBird database. As you can imagine, uh, eBird submissions may not be equal across the United States or across the world. Higher populations or density people, cities may have more observations than say, uh, for those in the United States, they may have more pop, uh, submissions than in the um, Midwest, uh, to the east of the Rockies type location where you have lower population densities. Um, east coast, we have a greater abundance. West coast, we have a greater abundance. So there may be more bird or submitting data. Now, to help prevent skewing that data from our model here, this model was generated by taking in um, different characteristics of where the observations were submitted, such as topography, climate, uh, habitat, et cetera. And that was all generated to apply over the entire United States so that the occurrence model we're seeing here um, negates the number of people submitting data, but instead applies the location and, the, and type of habitat that data was submitted and applies it over the entire United States. So what we're looking at is the likely occurrence you would see this single bird species. I know, that's a great question. What species? I haven't told you yet, and that's intentional. Um, I really enjoyed some of the observations you guys were making, so I'm curious. Does anybody have a guess as to what bird this may be? Robin, barn swallow, hummingbird, a passerine. Yes, it is a passerine. American robin, maybe. I'll put you guys out of your misery. This bird is a yellow warbler. Now, one thing I absolutely love with these occurrence maps 
or occurrence models is comparing and contrasting the actual live occurrence model, the movement of the model to a static range map. Because both the range map and the model provide us completely different information, yet each has very valuable information. If you look at our static range map here, I remember somebody making the comments that the yellow warbler going through the model is creating almost a circular motion about how it's migrating. It really seems to be migrating as it's coming down south only along the western coast. Whereas our static map, we see that yes, along the western coast, it does tend to go down, but we don't know whether that's northern movement or southern movement or both. Uh, however, our model would only show the United States, whereas this static map just show all of North America, Central, and South America. So looking and comparing and contrasting uh, occurrence, map, occurrence models and stationary range maps is very important. Now for us as educators, um, I want to point out the very conscious decision of how we're introducing these topics. Uh, I find these models incredibly valuable. So whether you're teaching through an inquiry process, through the five E's where you have to start with engage, or through student-centered learning, asking students to articulate their observations of these occurrence maps is a really phenomenal exercise. So we're gonna go through a similar topic. We now have two occurrence maps, and we're going to compare these two mystery maps side by side. Again, in the chat window, take your time to look at them, but then uh, share your observations in the chat window. Okay, yes, we're definitely making this observation that on map one, the map on the left, we definitely have a resident species. However, um, Laura, I believe you made the observation that there is still some movement in mystery map one. Whereas map two, we actually have very clear seasonal movement. Again, this is migration. Though the species doesn't completely leave the United States, there's definitely a clear pattern of seasonal movement. So that's our migration there. Um, yes, Brenda, we do clearly have the option that this is, these are both Eastern species, only found in the Eastern United States. Are there any other observations we're making? Is there anything similar between the two maps, perhaps? So they do a geograph uh, overlap both in the eastern United States. Yes, thank you for pointing this out, Dennis, Louise. Um, the, the Appalachian Trail area, so especially map one, you can point this out here. Um, you'll see there's less occurrence during certain parts of the season. In mystery map two, we also actually get a little bit there, but both, I actually want to highlight the Mississippi River Basin, focusing on that area. Now, of course, um, it's not important when looking at these models. I want to actually focus on uh, interpreting data from it, but I figured I'll ask you guys as being birders, any idea what birds these are? I heard a suggestion that mystery map one was a blue jay. Oh, 
Cardinal, maybe. I'm assuming Kelly, you're referring to Cardinal as Mr. Map 1, since that's a resin species. Potentially some sort of waterfowl. Norwegian blue, I don't know that bird. Robin for one, a finch for number two. Chickadee, interesting. Okay, I'll let you guys see our very first map, our mystery map one. Congratulations, Kelly, you got it correct. It's a Northern Cardinal, which I don't know why it's called Northern Cardinal compared to Eastern Cardinal since it's only found in the East. <laughs> I don't know. There are some cardinals, some species in the cardinal family in the south. Ah, uh, cardinals. cardinals. Yeah, and we also have the cardinal family over in the west. Anyways, sidetrack there. Um, we also have mystery map two, an eastern Phoebe. I don't think anybody gets flycatcher, but I do appreciate uh, the guesses. So. We just compared our very beginning, we just started the basic observations of a sound map. Our second one, we started to compare two sound maps side by side. We have one more map for you guys. And again, I'm gonna challenge you, take a moment to just look through the cycle and the observations. And then when you're ready in the chat window, please share those observations with us. Ah, Lauren, yes. Yeah. So it looks like we're observing the bird. It's definitely making movement potentially from South America. <laughs> they aren't migrating, they just disappear off the map entirely. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we are, dots are meaning the concentration. Cer there are definitely certain hot spots that have a higher likely uh, opportunity to see them. They could be coming from Mexico. So yes, what we're looking at, Louise, I love this. We are trying, we're making the possibility that those hot spots are occurring during the breeding season. So maybe those hot spots are the best place to live. And Patrick, yes, those hot spots could absolutely be related to cities. We're bringing in geography here. Who knew you could use birds to teach geography? But that's exactly what you guys are looking at. Those hotspots uh, geographically are cities. So we have Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, Houston. Uh, yep. Hotspots over North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, I can't, Raleigh. I can always want to say Rayleigh, which I know is wrong. <laughs> so based off of Detroit, yes. Uh, based off of we now can interpret this information of cities, let's make uh, an educated guess as to what this species might be. Because clearly it's only wanting to truly nest in the cities. Um, it can nest in other locations, but not as much. Nighthawk, chimney swift, house sparrow. Pigeon, maybe? Maybe something we consider a pest? Grackles, hummingbirds, barn swells, so many guesses. Who, I believe it was Matt. Matt, we should be giving you a gold prize. You and Kelly. It's a chimney swift. So what we're looking at here are chimney swifts. And for those of you who don't quite have the background knowledge, maybe chimney swifts originally nested in old growth trees that were hollowed out, which model what looks like a chimney. Um, with the decline in old growth trees and them being cut down, they adapted and instead reproduced in large massive chimneys. They will roost there predominantly. And so that's where we often find our chimney Swiss now because majority of our chimneys in mass quantities are in city areas. So that's why when we look at this data, we're actually seeing uh, geographic locations pop out. 
similar to when we looked at our northern cardinal and eastern phoebe we could start to see the mississippi river basin because they're clear distinct habitats that differentiate between other habitats and so we're seeing those trends and observations and that's a big takeaway point because of this incredible citizen science database, we are able to analyze and interpret many different trends. This just being on migration alone. If you are interested in going further with data interpretation, especially around citizen science data, I highly recommend for middle school and high school um, educators to look at the Birds Without Borders curriculum. It goes through eight lessons um, where you are utilizing real citizen science data and students go through modeling and tracking and analyzing the entire data. Uh, the, you can actually download the first lesson and the last lesson, discovering the ecological role of birds and creating a conservation plan for free on our website. And Kelly just shared the link to Birds Without Border in our chat window. Yes, occurrence maps, these occurrence models, Tom, are available to educators on the eBird website. I'll actually, Kelly will put the link in the chat window right now, but I'll actually show you as well on the eBird website when we explore that in just a moment. Now, again, we've talked about uh, and just, just touched the surface of the eBird database and how rich of a database it is. However, youth can also contribute to this massive database. And that's what really makes this motivating for kids. The best part of citizen science is that their observations really matter. Uh, the counts matter, and it doesn't matter whether they're a bird or hotshot or just a, an eight-year-old enjoying going on a walk with educators or with family at all. Now, about maybe five years back or so, eBird was reaching its 100th millionth observation. Put you in context, we're now at over 400 million observations. We're excited for our half a billion marker. But at its 100th millionth observation, everyone's lab was buzzing about which hotshot bird that we know is going to be the one that submits the 100th millionth observation. By hotshot birders, I mean many of the people who work here submit a checklist on their way into work, submit a checklist during lunch, submit a checklist on their way home from work, will leave work to go find a rare bird sighting, um, will submit a checklist when they get home at night, maybe that random owl. So we really have some intense birders here. But when that 100 millionth observation came in, it was this 12-year-old boy, Leron, who submitted the American Robin. And to us in the education department, that just reinforced and, and told those hotshot birders, it's not just you guys who are contributing. Every single observation matters. So one starting point that we have with kids and that you may experience when introducing kids to birds is that they may have bird blindness. They simply don't notice the birds that are around them. But we challenge you as the educator to have students take a second look because birds are everywhere. Uh, once you start noticing birds and once the kids you work with start noticing birds, they won't stop. We constantly have teachers emailing us about, oh, you know, we just hung up this bird feeder, and now every day the kids are coming and telling me, I saw this, I saw that. The parents won't stop telling us that their kids keep talking about birds. And that's what we want to start. We want to focus on this idea that the kids don't need to be bird experts, or you as the educator don't need to be bird experts to get engaged with birds. First, you just start off with the simple silhouette, identifying basic bird groups on that silhouette, such as number two, we can recognize that this is some kind of owl, or number three, recognizing that this is some kind of raptor. Once you can identify the basic groups, you can go from there to start looking at those groups of birds in a field guide, because most field guides will have the birds separated by group. 
In this image, we've added some more clues. We don't just have the silhouettes, but we now have size comparisons to each other. We also have habitat clues and behaviors of where birds might be located and what type of postures they may be in. I'm gonna test some of you birders real quick. Let's look at this bird right here in the middle. Now, before we identify the bird, I want you guys, for those who may know the bird, please identify characteristics that will help you identify this bird. What are some behaviors or features that help you identify this bird? Lauren, great, it's a medium-sized bird. I love the comparison between a robin and a crow. Ice cream cone, Ellen, that's cheating. Ellen, you've been on our, you've seen this slide before, you gave away my joke. This is the ice cream cone bird, but I'm glad it's stuck. A long pointed tail, a small bill. It's perching, and not just perching, but it's perching on the wire too. <laughs> Don't need to apologize, Ellen. It's great, because actually the fact that you can remember that it's the ice cream cone bird, um, that's an easy way to identify that this is a morning dove. Bonnie, that's correct. This is a morning dove. And we can look at that because many of you were identifying this long pointy tail. When we were doing this webinar, somebody immediately shouted out, that looks like an ice cream cone. And that's stuck with us ever since. And so kids come up with simple things like that and you encourage it, you help them follow through. They'll always be able to see a morning dove, recognize that long pointed tail perched on a wire and realize, hey, that's the ice cream cone bird. That's our morning dove. Looking at these silhouettes, these little clues in um, the habitat that really helps them uh, further identify their skills. Now, going through the silhouettes, taking in habitat clues, let's start looking at different color patterns, but there are many different free resources and inexpensive resources out there for you to help take that next step with identifying birds. For those of you in North America, the All About Birds website, it's a complete online field guide for North American birds. For those of you in North America, Mexico, I wanna say Belize, has it gone to Belize yet? Uh, it's branching out into other Central American countries, but Merlin Bird Idea, this is a, a bird idea that I cannot stop recommending that we've created. It goes through the process of asking five simple questions. Your phone knows two of them already of where you are and um, the date. And then you just do a size comparison, like what Laura said of is it between a crow and a robin size? What are up to three main colors and what is the bird doing? Like, is it perching on the wire? And then based off that information, I'll give you uh, a short list of what birds you're likely seeing. For those of you also in the United States, we also offer um, an inexpensive, inexpensive pack of bird ID cards as well. The teachers we've talked to, they rave about this. Um, so I highly recommend it. Kelly, do you want to share the link to Merlin in the window? The Merlin Bird ID app, Merlin Like the Bird. Uh, it's a free app for iPhones and Androids. That's the one I highly recommend. Shameless plug for us. If you want to go even further with bird identification um, and with eBird, such as having students identify bird body parts, uh, practicing and developing their sounds, if you want to receive the bird ID card and then take students through the process, of submitting bird data, then our most wanted birds kit is for you. The target age group is fourth through eighth grade, but it has been adapted for younger and older audiences. It's currently 25% off and you do get a free window bird feeder pictured here if you do purchase that. So Kelly's gonna share the link to most wanted birds in the chat window. But essentially through all these tools, like the most wanted birds kit, like the Merlin bird idea, 
um, like having students identify different characteristics. Students will then be able to not only see the birds, but put the names to birds. And that's really the next step for participating in eBird and citizen science. Now, Global Big Day. I've been saying it quite a few times for those who may not be aware. Uh, this Saturday is Global Big Day. It is the one day of the year where we at the Lab of Ornithology and our eBird team travels to different countries, but also to try and get as many birders as possible around the entire United States to share as many bird observations as possible. Uh, last year, I think maybe six or 7,000 bird species were observed in solely one day. Yeah, about, well, did we end up at two thirds? Two we're thirds, close two we were close to two thirds of bird population, or bird species. So we are trying to get as many bird species seen as possible in one day. Now, when Kelly and I will be going birding nonstop, and we'll be submitting all of our data through the eBird mobile app. It's a free app. I highly recommend it because, well, assuming you're okay becoming addicted to the eBird mobile app, I highly recommend it because everywhere Kelly and I go now, we are constantly just submitting our bird observations right into the app. It makes everything quick and easy. One other way, though, is that you can submit the old-fashioned way by exploring the eBird website. So let's go on to the eBird website. eBird website is ebert.org. Now, I remember somebody asked about the occurrence maps. Can you see my screen? Just make yes. sure you can. Okay. Um, no, my the screen. No. Nope. Hang on. You zoom share. Let's do this. Can you see it? No. So I need to start new share that. Hold on, folks. There we go. Okay, I'm on the eBird website here. It is eBird.org. And for those of you who are looking for the occurrence maps, I'm scrolling down. Under News and Features, we have occurrence maps here. Um, so that's just a simple way. You can click on that, and there are a whole variety of species there for you to observe and look at. What I want to show you guys is going through the exploring data and how you can create a custom checklist for a birding region that you may want to take kids out on. So we are in Ithaca, New York. Now there are several different ways we can go about this, but I recommend going to explore hotspots. Actually, no, let me just quickly make sure I have this on. Okay, we are on exploring hotspots. And if you know, you can enter in a hotspot name automatically, but most of you may not know a local hotspot name. So what in, I recommend the top right corner is entering in your city. So we're gonna enter in Ithaca, New York. And here's Ithaca. We have a whole bunch of these little dots and each of these dots is a hotspot. On the right hand side, it's categorized based off of species observed. So the higher number of species we've seen, the redder the dot is. And you can see our biggest hotspot here in Ithaca, New York, is Stewart Park. So we can click on this. There have been over 6,000 checklists submitted to Stewart Park. We've submitted quite a few there ourselves, mm -hmm. Kelly. Um, but we've had 265 species there. Now, for Kelly and myself, if we're going to go birding on Global Big Day, and we see that Stewart Park is the biggest hotspot in our area, that's a spot that we want to go birding in. So let's view the details of Stewart Park. We're hoping our internet works for us. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it, eBird. There we go. Okay, Stewart Park hotspot. It's just so many data it had to compile all together. That's what I'm going to believe. Um, what we can do is we can see all the data submitted by eBird. And we were just there this weekend. We were the most recent people to see Phil Collar is one of our uh, Teachers that went birding with us, as is Melanie Furr, 
and we were the most recent people to see wood thrushes and eagles and loons and uh, gadwalls. You guys saw gadwalls? Nice. Awesome. Well, so this is what we're looking at here. Because Global Bay Day is in the month of May, I can go up to the top here and only look at checklists submitted in May. And for me personally, I like to see only checklists that are submitted within the last 10 years. Um, in case, just to weed out any potential old data. That's a personal preference of mine. And what we can do is we can see in May, in the last 10 years, we've had 174 species seen. Now for us, what I would want to do is I'd want to create a printable checklist. Now that checklist will show me all the potential birds that we might see at Stewart Park. If this is something that may be of interest to you, I mean, it is a very daunting list, but it can be something where you pick and choose just the May species and go from there. Uh, another way that you can do this is just look and say, okay, what are all the birds only seen this year? So I know birds that are only, oh, thank you, sorry, only the current year. Um, so only in May of 2017, we've seen 80 species. So I'm looking at a checklist of birds that I know are currently in uh, Stewart Park. Again, these are options for you guys to look through if you want to uh, explore further eBird data. Um, from there, it, some of you may not have a hotspot that is currently in your area. I recommend looking at hotspots that may be in your area uh, and go from there. Oh, look, Kelly, recent visits. There you are. Now, let's finish off. I see we have 12 minutes left. So, that is just one other way of exploring eBird data. Now, the eBird database is incredibly massive. There's a whole other section on you being able to explore species specifically. You can look at a whole series of multimedia that's been uploaded, especially a rich database of pictures. We've had over 3 million photos submitted with eBird checklists. So this is just touching the surface. If you want to go further with exploring eBird data and the occurrence models specifically, we have a blog post, Mapping with Birds, that Kelly can share with you in the chat window, or Kelly already has shared with you. She can share it again. Um, uh, but what I'd like to do for us to finish up with tonight's webinar is to go through the process of sharing advice on how to take kids birding on one of these big global days. Now, I would like to open up to you guys in the chat window. So if you do have any recommendations or advice on how to take students, youth, families, etc., on bird walks, please feel free to feel free to enter that in the chat window. While that's gathering in the chat window, I'm gonna provide just a couple recommendations that we provide. First is giving kids a role. Uh, what we provide or what we recommend is identifying kids into smaller groups. One, this helps reduce the number of resources you may need. Not every kid needs a pair of binoculars or a field guide or to keep their own checklist. In this image, we have groups of three, where we have one child in charge of the checklist on the left, one child in charge of the bird field guide in the middle, and then one child in charge of spotting the birds with binoculars. So one, it forces them to develop their communication skills but also it's allowing them to switch roles around, try different techniques and strategies and helps reduce resources for you. Especially if you're going to have kids break up uh, into small groups or work individually, make sure you set time aside at the end to bring the group together as a large group and summarize the data. If you had three different groups of three, um, have each group identify what birds were seen. Did multiple people see that bird? Can you come up with a consensus of your best estimate? With eBird, the way they track data, 
for the uh, what they are looking for is your best estimate of the number of birds you saw or heard that you could positively identify to the best of your ability. So if you are watching a feeder, which is a common way to observe birds, especially from the classroom, you can, uh, you might have four chickadees fly in, then they'll fly away. Then you have three chickadees come in and then they fly away. Um, then you have two cardinals, a few jays, etc. But after that entire process, you may not want to take tallies of every single bird you see, but have a discussion as a group. What do you think our best estimate of the number of chickadees that visited? Some may say two, some may say seven, um, some may have tallied every single bird they saw and say 20. You may not have 20 individual chickadees. You may have only had four or five that were visiting continually but just kept leaving over a period of time. So having the group come together and talk about the best estimate. And then the, finally, the best advice we can uh, try and encourage you guys to do is continue citizen science outside of Global Big Day. Don't just go birding once, but try and continue that um, process by having kids go out further and further. So I'm seeing, are there any suggestions on the, okay. So with that being said, we are a few minutes early, excellent. Kelly and I will take any questions you may have. If you are an educator who would like to receive a letter of completion for attending this webinar, please just email us birdsleuth at cornell.edu. Um, just email us that you want a, a letter of completion and we'll be happy to send that to you. But from there, I recommend if you have any questions, put those in the chat window. If not, happy birding. We're excited to see how many bird species are seen throughout Global Big Day.